when you think about his grace and his mercy, then you have to give him praise. Because he's worthy from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. I was able to talk to some of the brothers on the boat yesterday. Because every now and then, I try not to bug folk, but every now and then when the door opens, I have to tell them that the Lord brought me this far. It's the Lord that opened up a door and made a way. It's because of his grace that I'm able to stand in this place. I give him thanks and I give him praise. I don't have to be prompt or pushed. All I have to do is just think of his goodness and all that he's done for me. Then I've got to give him the praise, the honor, and the glory. Well, I don't want to keep you too long. Today is Father's Day, and I want to talk from this thought, a father's love, a father's love. In the context of the text where our lesson comes from, Luke chapter 15, you do know that Jesus is the master teacher, and Jesus basically taught with parables, and parables are universal stories with a heavenly and moral message. And even as Jesus begins to teach in this text, it is because of God's grace and mercy that he is talking to the Pharisees. There were tax collectors and sinners that had come and they were gathered around because they wanted to hear Jesus. But these religious people, these Pharisees and scribes of the law, they begin to murmur and complain about why should we spend time with Jesus when Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. He hangs out with prostitutes. He hangs out with tax collectors. He hangs out with the least of these. And then Jesus begins to teach, and, and, and he opens with this parable um, of the lost sheep. He, he, he says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep, and you lose one. Doesn't he leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and say, Rejoice, I have found my sheep, which was lost. He says, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, you need to understand in the context of the text that the shepherd would not leave the 99 sheep alone. The 99 sheep are left with the hireling, the people that are hired to assist the shepherd. But the shepherd loves the sheep so much that he'll go and look for the one that gets lost. And it's only because of his grace and his mercy. This particular sheep is a metaphor for us. The, the sheep didn't um, mean to get lost. It wasn't looking to be lost. But you know, it began to nibble on some grass and wasn't looking up. And it nibbled and nibbled, and then the sheep found itself out there lost. Some of us, it's not our intent to move away from the church. We just decide that that Sunday we don't feel that well. As a matter of fact, the adversary whispers, you worked all week. God knows you're tired. You know you're tired. And you find yourself watching the soap opera or washing your car or doing laundry. And that felt pretty good to you. And so then the next week, something else may come up. And the next week, and before you know it, you have wandered out there and you're lost. But praise God for his grace and his mercy. He'll come back and look for us until he finds us. You cannot be content when you're outside too long 
of the grace and mercy of God. Somebody's glad already that you came to church today. You've already been blessed. And then he goes on to tell another story. He says, suppose a woman has 10 coins and loses one. She lights a lamp and sweeps the whole house and searches until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice, I found my coin, which was lost. I tell you, in the same way, in the presence of the angels of God over one who repents. Now, in this particular pericope of Scripture, um, in the first one, the sheep wandered away unintentionally and got lost. But in this case, the woman lost her coin in the house. There are some folk, because you're not paying attention to the word that's going forth, you're not listening with intentional hearing to the music that's being sung, you're in the house, but you're lost. But if you keep on hanging out, God is going to find you. And when he finds you, and when you're baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are going to rejoice. Because where there are two or three that are gathered together in his name, he has promised to meet us there. Okay, well maybe you didn't have ten coins, but I do know how Mrs. Thornton feels when she loses one earring. She said, Jim, have you seen my earring? There's one that looks just like this. I can't just wear one. I've got to have the one that matches. And when she found it, in an unintended place, look, I found my earring. That was lost. You know, won't you rejoice with me? We're all here just because of God's grace and his mercy. Some of us wandered away. Some of us were even intentional in wandering away, deciding that we weren't going to be bothered with this anymore. But God found us. I'm so glad that he allows U-turns. Some of us got lost in the house. But every now and then, God will send a word from somebody, a song from somewhere that will arrest your soul. And you know that it wasn't luck. You know that it wasn't by chance. You know that it wasn't by happenstance. But you know that it was the grace and mercy of God. This brings me to our text. And I want to talk about a father's love. I want to suggest, first of all, that a father's love is generous. A father, a real father, is generous in his love and in his support of his children. Here it is, there was a man, he had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. This father was extremely generous. This father may not have been of African-American descent, because I could not even imagine when my dad was alive, saying, sir, give me my portion, and I'm an only son. Can you imagine? As a matter of fact, he called me to tell me that he wanted me to come because we had a joint account, and he wanted me to come because he couldn't get my name off the account without my permission. <laughs> and so he's in the bank, and he's fussing with the banker. He doesn't have anything to do with this money. This is my money. I put every dime in this bank. I think retrospectively I wouldn't have done it, but the way I was raised was that it was his. I went down and I signed, and they actually took my name off. This father is generous. First of all, you only should come into the inheritance once the father has died. So therefore, there's a certain amount of disrespect that this young son has for the father because he no longer wants to adhere to the directions and the instructions of the father. He wants to be on his own and to do his own thing. This father is generous. 
So he divided the property between them. Now you need to know that the younger son would receive a third of the estate and the older son would receive two thirds. The younger made the decision. He wanted his freedom. He wanted to leave the teachings and the discipline of his father. I'm sure that the father's heart had to be broken. The father had to become discouraged and dismayed, but he understood that sometimes when children are grown, you have to let them go and put them in the hands of the Lord is what we call tough love. When you try to hold people against their will, you build up resentment and challenges and tension in the family that need not be. God can fight your battle better than you can. So this father is extremely generous. He has generous love. It's hard to let folk go, but real love does not behave itself unseemly. It is not kind. It is not easily provoked, but real love is strong enough that if you want to go, real love will give you your freedom while you stay at home with a bleeding heart. But if you know the Lord, and if you trust him, then you know that our forefathers and mothers was right when they said the Lord will make a way out of no way. Or the Lord will make a way somehow. Here it is. Not long after, the younger son got together all he had, put his stuff together, sat off, and went to a distant country. You need to know that when you have money, when you have prosperity, when you have popularity, you will have friends. The best test of true friendship is can a real friend hang out with you when your money runs funny? Can they hang out with you when the bottom drops out? Can they hang out with you when you lose your health? Will they still be there? Anybody can hang out with you when you can pick up the tab. Anybody can hang out with you when you can help them pay their rent. Anybody can hang out with you when you can give them a ride from point A to point B. But when you have a challenge, can that person still be there for you? Text says that after he had spent everything, he was probably, I don't know where he went, maybe he went to Las Vegas. Uh, maybe he went to the Warriors game. Unfortunately, they lost. But what, I'm, what we have to wait to see now, brothers, uh, Brother Bertrand, is that now that Durant has an injury and Thompson has an injury and Curry is tired, um, can they still come together as a team or will they decide each to go their own way? But that's another sermon. But we don't know. But the Bible says that after he had spent everything and the country that he was in, there was a famine in the land. And he had nothing. And he began to be in need. All of the people that he had helped were not there now. All of the persons he had party to, all of the places where he had spent his money, these folk were nowhere to be found. So he went out and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. It was not his own country, he was in another country. And this person obviously had no respect for his culture, no respect for his religion, because if you know anything about the Jewish faith, the Jewish people do not eat pork. And he finds himself working in the pig pen with no food and having to eat the food that was even fed to the pigs. He is now in a compromising, very difficult and inhumane situation. He has absolutely nothing. And sometimes, God allows you, allows us to be so low that you have to reach up to see the bottom. I've come to the place in my life, Brother Harold Farrell, where I'm understanding better that you don't realize that God 
is all that you need, and to God is all that you got. And when you realize that he's all that you got, that's when you begin to talk to him. And, and that's when you begin to walk with him. And that's when you'll find that he'll come in with you. I hear John saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, woman, boy, girl will open up that door, I will come in. Has anybody ever been lonely at night and, and had nowhere to go and no one to wipe your tears, but you called on the Lord in the midnight hour and somehow he sent his peace that passes all understanding. Somehow he sent a light in dark places. Somehow he sent hope in the midst of despair. It's sometimes when we reach the bottom that we reach up for God. I want to suggest that a father's love is sacrificial and a father's love is unconditional. I've got to believe in my sanctified mind that this father, while his son had taken his share of the inheritance and had now gone to a far distant country, I'm confident that this father didn't stop praying for his son. This father prayed that God would protect him, that God would keep him in his care, that God would allow no hurt, harm, or danger to come to him, that God would speak to him, that God would make a way out of no way. I want to say to you that if you love your children like I love my only son, I've come to the place now where I realize that I've done all that I can do. I've taught as best as I could. I've disciplined as well as I could. All I can do now is call on the name of the Lord, and I trust in God. I know he cares for me. I know that he'll make a way somehow. Here it is. And uh, the father doesn't even know what's going on, but most of us are here this morning, not because we've been that good, neither have we kept his commandments that well, but somebody prayed for us. Somebody had us on their mind and took the time to pray for us. Somebody ought to praise God for a praying father, ought to praise God for a praying grandfather, praise God for a praying mother, praise God for a praying aunt, praise God for a praying friend. I love when Thursday comes in this church because when Thursday comes, there's some seniors that come together and they bombard the throne of God with prayer. And I know that the Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Here it is. The text says, and when he came to his senses, I like the way the King James puts it. The King James says, and when he came to himself, uh, um, the father couldn't bring him to that place. Um, only prayer could bring him to that place. He was so arrogant that he couldn't come to that place on his own, but he only needed God to bring him to a place where he had nobody else but God. And sometimes I think that we enable our children. We, we, we help them out of bad spots when we need to let God work it out. And as long as you enable them, then you will continue to cripple them. And if I got a finger pointed at you, I got nine coming back at me. And so he says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. And what he understands from his teaching is that he has to humble himself under the mighty hand of God. When you're wrong, you can't go to God in an arrogant way. You can't go back home demanding things, but you need to come humble and compassionate and prayerfully into the person's presence. He says, I will set out and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Some of us can never really have real forgiveness until we recognize that we have done wrong. I often say to people that I count counsel, and I'm almost done, do you want to win or do you want reconciliation? I've been married enough now to know that if you want to be in a relationship and you want reconciliation, then it's not necessary to win every argument. 
I've been your pastor long enough to know that there's some things that you want that I disagree with, but if we're going to have this relationship, I'm willing to humble myself under the mighty hand of God because God says that whosoever will lose their life will find it, but whoever tries to find their life will lose it. I'm willing to take up my cross and follow Jesus, knowing that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Here it is. He says, when he gets to his father, he says, I'll say that I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me just like one of the hired servants. But a father's love is compassionate. The text says, so he gets up and he goes to his father. And I'm sure that while he's going to his father, um, he's praying that the father would receive him. He's praying that the father would open up a door for him. He was praying that the father would just allow him to be with one of the servants. But let me tell you something, that while you're yet praying, God sends an angel on the way. And by the time you're finished, the work is already done. We just sing a song, trust my Lord today. Let him make a way. I do know, rich or poor, Christ is the answer for you. Here it is. But while he was yet a long way off, if you're taking notes, a father's love is not only um, generous, a father's love is not only forgiven, but a father's love is compassionate. Here it is, and it is forgiven. But while he is a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. That means that the father had anticipation that God was going to answer his prayer day in and day out. He was looking for his son to come home. He didn't know how he was going to come home. He may come home broken. He may come home a little bit bent up, but he is going to come home because he that believe in that God will make a way out of no way. You've got to have faith that God can do what God can do. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, but one that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those that diligently seek him. I pray that God will bring this ramp to a reality. I bombard the place with prayer. I can see it in my mind's eye. I could see that the kitchen one of these days was going to have new appliances and soon we're going to have a confection and stove in the place. You got to see those things that are not as if they were. Some young person that's going to school, I know you might be in your freshman year, but you've got to begin to pray and see yourself walking across the stage with a diploma in your hand. I know that somebody may be on public transportation and you may have one of those, what do they call it? Metro cards, but you have to get on the train. I know when I used to have to get a token and put it into the slot, but every time I got in the Black Pearl taxi, I knew that wasn't going to be that way all the ways, that the Lord would make a way, that one day I'd be driving my own car, that one day I'd be paying my own rent, that one day I would have my own house, that one day I'd have my own job. You've got to know that the God that we serve is able to bring to pass that which he has promised, that there is nothing too hard for God, that that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so the son now gets to his father. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, who is compassionate and he is forgiven, he says to his son, Quick! Bring the best robe. The robe signifies the fact that he's been restored to the sonship that he had before. He says, and put a ring on his finger and put sandals on his feet, which means that he is no longer a slave, but he's back in the family. And the ring means that he's restored to the position that he had before. And when God blesses you, when God turns your life around, the only thing you can do is give God praise, honor, and glory. He says, bring the fatted calf and let's kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this, my son of mine, was dead and is alive again. He was lost 
and is found. So they begin to celebrate. And that's what I'm trying to say to us this morning as I try to take my seat. If God's done something for you, you ought to celebrate what God has done. If he's opened up a door. If you didn't have a job and God gave you a job and now you can pay your bills, you got more money than you ever had before, you ought to celebrate and give God praise. If you've ever been sick and you thought you could not get well, but somehow God made a way out of no way and he touched your body. Your blood pressure was high, but now it's regulated. You ought to give God praise for what God has done. Somebody was about to go out of your mind, but you prayed and you remembered the word of God that I'll keep him in perfect peace if he keeps his mind stayed on me. And that's why I give him praise, honor, and glory. When I come into this place, I have to bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits with me. I've got to be like Mahalia Jackson. I've got to fake him for how he's brought me. Got to fake him for how he's kept me. Got to fake him that he's never left me. I got to give him the praise, the honor, and the glory, because he's worthy. Now, everybody can't celebrate with you when God blesses you. Some folks just begin to tolerate you <coughs> when God blesses you. And I know that there's some people here, you've worked hard, you've been faithful, and you wonder, when is your blessing coming? When is your turn coming? I read in the paper the other day, uh, some man, he, he did something. He, got some kind of tear off and he won six million dollars. Did you ever read it in the paper the other day? He won, no, he won seven million dollars. And um, the, the boss asked him, um, was he gonna leave him or would he continue to work? He says, consider this my last day. <laughs> you know, um, and, and I don't know how many times uh, I'm not telling you to gamble or anything like that. I'm telling you to trust God. But every now and then, since he blessed somebody over there, they say you got to be in it to win it. You know, I'm wondering when this is going to happen. You know, I believe that it can happen. I, he may not come that way. He may come another way. But I trust that he can do what he can do. But what I want to suggest that this text helps us understand that you can be assured, as I come to close, that whatever your situation is, God has not forgotten you. God knows where you are. God knows what you have done. And in God's own time, God is going to bless you. Maybe God is not blessing you right now because you're not ready. God is trying to get you in a position so that when he blesses you, you'll be able to handle what God wants to give you. I mean, it took me so many years to get to be your pastor. But when I got finally in the position, I realized that God had to move when I wanted him to move. I probably wouldn't have the job. But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with the wings of eagles. They'll run and not get weary. They'll walk and not faint. And you can be discouraged. God understands your discouragement. But whatever you're going through, take it to the Lord in prayer. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field and when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked, what's going on? He says, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatted calf. And, and he's back safe and sound. I can understand the brother's position. I can understand because I remember when I thought I should be doing a trial sermon and my father said, well, James, I want you to take me over to Cornerstone Baptist Church because Dr. Ray's son is going to be doing a trial sermon and you're not going to do a sermon yet because you're not ready yet. But you take me over there, we're going to celebrate with this boy and then after that we have to go to breakfast. And I was like, Lord, what about me? You know I love you. I've been driving this man up and down. I've been coming to the church. I've been visiting the sick. I've been cleaning the toilets. I've been cutting the grass. Lord, what about me? Whatever you're going through, I'm telling you, you can take it to the Lord in prayer. He'll work it out in his own time. He may not come when you want him. Now, when I was younger, that didn't make any sense to me because I said, if he can't come when I want him, then he certainly can't be on time. But now I understand he may not come when you want him, but when your time and his time 
lines up, that is the right time. That becomes the Kairos moment where God will show up and God will show out. They said to the Father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fatted calf for him. The father responds, my son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. In other words, your brother has already gotten the third of his estate, which means that the rest of the estate belongs to you. And all of the money that will be acquired as a result of the estate will belong to you. And the farm will belong to you. And the, cat and the fatted calves will belong to you. Everything that I have is going to go to you because God knows your faithfulness. God knows what you've been through. And when God gets ready to bless you, nobody can take you down. When God lifts you up, no demon in hell can bring you down. What God has for you is for you. This we have to do because your brother was lost but is now is found. We had to celebrate, but the fact that we celebrate him does not negate or take away the blessings that God has for you. Somebody need to praise God in advance for what God is going to do. I see healing coming in this place. I see prosperity coming in this place. I see joy coming in this place. I see hope coming in this place. I see God making a way out of no way because the God that we serve is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we're able to ask or think. How do you know? Know that James because every promise in the book is mine every chapter every verse every line oh the blessings of his love divine every promise in the book is mine behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised first, and those of us who are alive shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Because when this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, I've got another building, not made with hands, but eternal in the heaven. I hear Peter said, Lord, we'll left all to follow you. Jesus says, Peter, there's neither man that's left father, mother, brother, or sister for the kingdom of God's sake. Watch this now. Who shall not receive more in this present time and in the life to come? And what I want to suggest is that God's not gonna bless you when you die. But if you can give him some praise right now, God will open up the windows of heaven, pour out blessings upon you that you shall not have room enough to contain them. And if you can be happy for somebody else, that means that you know that God is in your neighborhood. I like to be around some blessed folk. I don't mind being around faith because she don't mind praising God. I don't want to be around somebody that takes away my spirit, but I want to be around somebody who knows that the Lord woke me up this morning and started me on my way and gave me another chance. I got to bless his name. I got to give him praise, honor, and glory in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son name of the Holy Ghost. And so what I want to sing, choir, is this, for our invitational hymn. Because I know you may be going through something, but I want you to know that God knows what you're going through. So Lydia, 